All right. Hello, folks. Welcome back to Excellent 3, the podcast where we talk about the plays and players from Excellency's League of Legends tournaments. I'm your host, quite indubitably. Here I have Doctor, as always, our analyst who is now a native of Heavy League, although he once found his homeland in (laughs) Mid-League. And here to fill our void from when Zephyr left us is our new comic relief analyst from Mid League, Cowboy Casts. Thank you. I know absolutely nothing. Don't put analyst in there. <laughs> Fantastic. I feel if I don't at least verbally acknowledge that you're kind of supposed to kind of sort of be an analyst, I feel like Jake Kelton will be sad and be like, oh no. Oh, we're poor bullying cowboy. the new person already. We're bullying oh, well. the kid. No. <laughs> No, the 16-year-old. All right. Well, um, Excellency likes to make more and more and more and more things happen each week with our League of Legends tournaments. So today I am happy to report that we just saw the conclusion of the first week of our first ever Light League that we get to stream. I say first ever, first ever that we've been covering on this podcast. I think it's season two for Light League in its existence. Um, But huge shout out to them. We have some fun teams participating. Uh, Go ahead and check out the VODs on stream if you haven't, because guess what? Zephyr is a human on camera again. Casting for Light League there. Unfortunately, I missed him. I missed him. (laughs) He's a specific brand. A mean brand, but a specific brand. Listen, I got to deal with him every week still, because he works with us over on Heavy League. So, you know, count count your blessings. Indubitably, count them. Many of them. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know what? I have a soft. He's not spot. here to defend himself, so we have to. <laughs> That's true. That means we get to. Good. That means we get to bully him, and he can't fight back. So, I, you know. I exactly. have a soft spot for young, mean people. I don't know what it is. Anyhow, um, in Light League, we have such lovely teams joining us as Shadowblade Slash with an exclamation point, so you know it's trying to cut itself on that edge. Degenerate Esports. Uh, which we definitely will not get confused with any other teams competing in Excellency ever. Darkseid's Academy, which is really cool because we have Darkseid, of course, participating in mid-league. And uh, we have Florida State. Florida State Esports, so another one of those college teams. Hey, we got the entirety of Florida playing in mid-league? Yes, we have the entirety of Florida playing actually in light league this is light Light league League, sorry not mid league no you don't get you don't get all of florida they get zephyr gets all of florida you know how many easy jokes could come from that why don't i get florida oh yeah you know we can just do so much with you know the gators and the drugs i don't i i I don't know how much how many drug references or jokes (laughs) that we could make around florida i mean don't get me wrong the jokes are easy but at what point is it just too cheap it's low-hanging fruit definitely yeah well um but yeah i don't, we, I don't like looking for it you know? we've got um some divine ascension obsidian going on um and apparently there is both degenerate esports and degenerates reformed from what i'm looking at Um, which are the rosters do not lie to separate different teams, degenerates reformed and degenerate esports. This will never be confusing on light league ever. Um, and yeah, I don't remember if I mentioned merciless, uh, and redefy unleashed is, also participating and at that point I have named all of the Light League teams and their wonderfully confusing and or edgy names. So now that having two degenerates is man, one confused me. Then again I also got like it's hollow up in here, you know? So it's like Right. So ultimately we've got 
three degenerates completely at all. Wait, you know what? I think I said the other degenerates were in mid-league. They're not in mid-league, aren't they? They're in heavy league, aren't they? I'm so confused. No. My brain no is dead. In heavy league. Oh, that's in mid-league. It was in mid-league. Okay, I'm not going crazy. I thought for a second, like, wait a minute. It's a little hard to believe Who are that, the degenerates in mid-league? Listen, it's, it's a little hard. hard to believe. That. You know, it's, it's you're, I choose oh your God. words carefully. You are going crazy. Oh, OBS Ninja yeah. going funky. Yeah, OBS Ninja is like mm, degenerates we don't like. But yeah, <laughs> this. that is just so many degenerates to worry about. I'm concerned. So yeah. uh, let's move well. on to the true hub of degeneracy. Which is mid league, of course. How much As of this always. have you scripted? Uh, not you the degeneracy joke. Believe not the, it or you not, did that on your own. I did Impressive. that on my own. Thank you, thank you. Zephyr never acknowledged me. <laughs> Don't See, play him like that, dude. Don't Cowboy's play him like already that. so much better, right? <laughs> Don't flatter me, please. I mean, already on episode one, I, like, did an entire segment standing you, so, like, there's there's no going back at this point. I can only lean in from now on. Oh, God. But speaking of leaning in, we got to see something really exciting on stream in mid-league this past week because it was pretty clear to us from the get-go that well, Glaive Esports Rose was going to be a force of nature. And I have said before that Meme City Esports Rush truly and utterly terrifies me because I have been somewhat familiar with them before they came to Excellency. And I've seen what kind of teams that they've been able to beat slash give a run for their money. And those are teams which have similarly terrified me. So I definitely had a lot of expectations for Meme City Esports Rush going into this, and they did not disappoint me. So we really got to see them live up to their potential this week when we saw on stream how Meme City Esports Rush stacks up against Glaive Esports Rose. And they stack up pretty yeah. well against Glaive Esports Rose, <laughs> incredibly so. I mean, we're used to seeing, or at least in these past couple weeks, we have become accustomed to seeing Glaive Esports Rose itself be a pretty dominant team. And here, Meme City Esports Rush basically completely crushed them 2-0 in very decisive victories. We're not seeing a ton of back and forth in terms of who has control of the resources in the game, in those games that were streamed. So this week, it's made pretty obvious to us who's top dog. It's Meme oh, City yeah. Esports Rush. That is terrifying. Yeah, 100%. Um, from like a little insider view in the mid-league, it's not a surprise to any of us at all that Meme City is on top because... Literally, like, before week one even started, we all knew that Meme City and Glaive were going to be the, like, the big dogs, you know? Uh, however, to myself, personally, at least, seeing Meme City esports come on top of Glaive was actually quite a surprise. Right. I mean, I don't think anyone, like, truly knew how they were going to stack up against each other. Um, and if anything, right, let's say... In a hypothetical other world, um, Meme City Esports Rush, two old Glaive Esports Rose, but they were really close games where the teams were kind of trading advantages back and forth. And, you know, one team would gain an incremental lead and then the other team would grab some resources and push forward. That's not what we saw. I wouldn't be surprised if we'd seen that universe, though, because... These are both teams that we've seen be pretty dominant over resources, who have picked their fights and their objectives wisely. But to see the universe, the timeline that we are actually living in, 
where Meme City Esports Rush comes in and completely crushes Glaive Esports Rose, at least in this set, does a lot of credit for the kind of dominance and respect that Meme City Esports Rush can command. Yeah, definitely. Um, I don't really have anything to add to that. All right, <laughs> then. I, I will say that this this matchup actually made it into the heavy broadcast team chat when we were talking this last Thursday after the show because you know we were talking about how these two teams stacked up and you know some of us were like I just don't believe it like Glaive is just so unstoppable and Zephyr was like listen I worked for Meme City. They're going to wipe the floor with them. I knew it was going to happen. I believed all the way through. And I was like, yeah, okay, Zephyr. But, like, I mean, it's true. Like, when you see these two teams stack up against it, when one team can come out ahead so quite convincingly, you know, it does kind of put some knowledge there. And it makes it interesting to see how, when they come back around and face each other again, what adaptions can really be made. Yeah, you know, it would be really cool to see Glaive Esports Pros manage to learn from this experience. Um, but I'm going to be perfectly honest, right? There are there are certain situations in which a team is dominant and we can see what's working for them and it's easy to pick out what you're going to have to focus on if you have any hope of successfully defeating this team. But I mean, this is still relatively early. We haven't seen too much from Meme City Esports Rush. So there is some extent sure. to which we don't really understand their team identity yet. And there's another extent to which their victory kind of feels just like player gap. Right? Um, like in, in one of these games... Um, Am I even looking at the right game? I'm not sure. I'm <laughs> let me <laughs> let me click on my links again to make sure I'm looking at the right game here and I'm not feeding you false information. And now I can actually you tell. Know. Okay, it was game 1. Okay, in game 1, Meme City Esports Rush has their bot lane Swain die once and support Tarek die twice. Three members on their team never die. That's Volibear, Kha'Zix, and Seraphine. And that is, yes, the Seraphine mid indeed. Um, Which is just broken, by the way. Riot, please nerf. And by, I, I, still, I still stand by. Seraphine is cringe. Bad champion. Garbage. Hater. By the way, <laughs> Doctor, there's this really cool thing that happens in mid league where they build Volibear right. And they build Volibear like a tank instead of AP. How does that make you feel? It makes me feel great for anybody that was watching the Fnatic versus G2 match yesterday. The exact same thing happened, and Whipwo just 1v9'd on that tanky Volibear, you know, that actually builds correctly. So if you if you want actual, you know, game how and how to play that champion, he beat it into Camille, by the way, which is not exactly an amazing matchup. So... Yeah, build build tanky Volibear. Don't build Riftmaker or whatever the hell we saw that week. Yeah, there's uh there's also this really cool thing. Uh, the mid league hasn't quite figured it out yet. Uh, but there's this really cool thing, uh, called banning Olaf. Not many people have heard of it. Uh, <laughs> even after the nerfs, why ban Olaf? We've said it every single week. And do you want to know what the mid league doesn't ban? I'm guessing Might it be Olaf. Olaf? No, actually, they don't ban Camille, but they also don't ban Olaf. <laughs> well, so. you know, I definitely would complain about that more maybe last week, but now we're contending with the new Udir, which honestly scares me a lot more than Olaf. Ooh, Obvious Ninja's going funky again. Ooh, I got yeah. my mask on. Uh, Be masking, yes. fellas. Cool. I'm safe. <laughs> Uh, yes, you're I don't really know how to feel about the Udir because uh, if I'm remembering correctly, we saw it in heavy this week too, mm -hmm. and I'm trying to remember the actual outcome of that matchup. <clears throat> but was that in our first series? I'm gonna have to look and be more specific in just a second. Oh wait, Riot needs me to sign in. W. Um, but yeah, Udir itself is just an interesting champion. I do think, from an ease of execution standpoint, I think 
Olaf is probably the better pick just because it's so much easier to just hit Q and kill people a billion times. Whereas with Udyr, you need to have like half of a brain to still be able to do stuff. So I, I think we'll still, for the most part, continue to see more uh, Olaf play than Udyr play in the grand scheme of things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was Udyr. Yeah. It was Udyr into Gragas. And right. yeah, fair enough. That um, was game it- one, actually. But yeah. I mean, we see... Um, I mean, talking about Udir and mid league, um, Udir actually gets through twice in the other stream set that I want to talk about. One Brain Boys versus Omega Gaming Unleashed. Um, for whatever reason, um, and I have some serious questions for the One Brain Boys drafting plan. And that is, why the Ooh. heck did you let them onto Udir again? I mean, Udir is a pick that is so wild, so obnoxious, so relentless in its ganks and its ability to affect and completely disrupt your game plan if you, like, care about not getting dumpstered early. Isn't, that, isn't the this, answer simple, though? They have one brain. It's just one, one brain. brain. How much how much planning can they actually get done with one singular brain? Uh, you he's, know? He's got- I, I I recall, you know, the casters on deck saying that the one brain got into the right place during one of these drafts. And it was the draft that they uh banned Udir. No oh no, they never banned Udir. That's the problem. They let Udir through twice. It was the draft that they decided to bring out a Zed, which what? confuses me as well. Um Yeah, don't don't play Zed, kids. I have seriously no clue why or how they decided Zed was a good idea uh, amongst the one-brained boys, but Omega Gaming Unleashed, all they had to do was pull out a Karma Mid, and they were fine. Oh, Jesus. Karma Mid. <laughs> yeah, I, that made it work. Look, man, Karma Mid is fun, okay? That's coming from a jungle main, my guy. I and mean, speaking I- of... I play Oriana, so it's the same yeah, thing, just more, going more damage. I mean, going back to Udir. For, okay. Like, so, I, I'll be honest. I started playing in 2019, and uh, since 2019, I've always known I've been a jungle main. Since 2019, Udir has been my kryptonite every single year, even when he was garbage. <laughs> and people were like, dude, you suck at jungle. Just learn how to play against him. And now he's OP, so now I can laugh at people. It's like, haha, you doubt me. I'm still bad. <laughs> right. And you know, the <laughs> worst part about a pick like Udir is before this, he was already pretty fast, right? He's already relatively scary if he's running at you and you're a squishy. Uh, hi, oh, yeah. I'm, I'm the support player who plays squishy supports. Um, so, you know, a player like me has to get very used to Udir's speed because if he's ganking me, I've got a very narrow window in which to CC him before he murders us. And even after CCing, I probably have to blow a flash because I was probably too pushed up anyhow. But the... Oh my god, what a good kitty. Um, <laughs> Today is all over the place. You know what? This isn't the Excellency podcast. This is this is a pet stream. This is actually what this is. This is a pet scream. Scream. I'm screaming. I'm screaming because Udir is annoying and I hate it. And since when was a pick so annoying that the score esports actually like reported on the league meta in a video? Like to me it's just wild that Udir is sufficiently fast that the score esports said to themselves, hold up, we got to make a video on this. I mean, what more is there to say other than stun, run, job done, right? Like, that's all the thing needs to do. Why would you say that? Why would you say that? Because I saw it on Twitter the other day. It's like a meme or something. I I don't know. So you're stealing memes and you're putting them onto the Exelon 3 podcast? That's what we do here. Welcome to the show. Yeah, I, I can confirm the best jokes are stolen. Um, in fact, I am, you heard it here, folks. I didn't. I didn't say it. I, way. I am planning. I, I am planning on stealing your shiny rock thing 
for my friends anyhow. They'll never see it coming. They'll be like, oh my gosh, Claire just got so much wittier about yeah. calling the Nexus a shiny rock. Like, obviously, she's the best. And I'm going to gain social capital off of jokes that I've stolen from you. That is my plan. But no, you're honest about it. And I respect that. Thank you. That plan aside, I would like to give just a little bit of an update in what happened off stream in mid league. Um, because off stream, there was a little bit of a trend going on of mid gap games. So first of all, the legendary wolves who I understand cowboy is now contractually a legendary wolves stan. Yeah, exactly, of course. <laughs> well, congrats, because your bias team has to own one Brain Boys, including um, game one of that set. Uh, their mid laner just absolutely carries on rise. He goes 13-0, and 0, and he's literally doubled the amount of the next highest damage on his team, which is comically a support Jeez. Maokai, but we're not going to talk about that. <laughs> He out damages on Maokai. <laughs> That's, yep, rise. <laughs> Come on, please. I don't know. It's, it's not my fault that the next highest damage dealer on their team was support Maokai. It just happened. No, that's okay? not. A, that's not a bad. No, Maokai does too much damage. Imperial yeah, man we... busted. We had this discussion, what was it last week, I think, about support Maokai and how when it works, it's amazing. And when it doesn't work, it's equally amazing in the opposite direction. So <laughs> the fact that it didn't do the most damage on the team is somewhat surprising. It's kind of like when you have that support Zyra, like it's always going to be at the top of the charts and there's nothing you can really do about it. But losing to Rise makes sense too. So it's a machine gun mage. I think Rise is in a weird spot. People are saying he's bad because he doesn't have Roa anymore. Um, but I think that you just need to be a little bit more creative. I don't know what you would pick for him because I don't I don't initially see any mythics that work for him. But I mean I can see him being pretty strong. Okay. Yeah well... I feel I feel like with the uh sorry to cut you off. Uh okay. with the the removal of Rod of Ages. I feel like you could say the same thing about pretty much anybody who wanted to build that, like Aurelian mm -hmm. Soul or. I mean, Aurelian the only reason Anivia is good, <laughs> like the only reason Anivia is good with the removal is because she got mega buffs, right? Like, oh yeah. But like, yeah, I don't know what Brian wants. Trash. I don't know. And but. those Anivia buffs were more or less aimed at compensating for her loss of Roa. Um, mm -hmm. I am not. But they didn't do the same thing to Aurelian Soul or Rise. I don't. Right. Um, but to be fair, when Aurelian Soul gets buffed, everyone cries because all of the Aurelian Soul one tricks suddenly gain way too much power. <laughs> well, you could say I that mean, about any saw... one trick. I'm a new yeah. one trick. They removed his movement speed yeah. by five and now he's bad. Like... Yeah, but the thing about Aurelian Soul, right, is pretty much no one plays him except for the Aurelian Soul mains. Yeah. So we actually saw an Aurelian Soul in week one of Heavy League in VBO versus uh, Lotus, and it went three and eight. So don't play the dragon, kids. I mean, play Aurelian Soul is a fun time, but yes, it's also a dangerous, risky time. And honestly, like if you're not an Aurelian Soul player, you probably should be picking anything but Aurelian Soul. That being said, while I'm not exactly an authority on what you should be building on Rise at any given time. I can tell you what was built on Rise in mid-league in that game with our 13-0 and 8 Rise, and he went with the Leandri's Mythic, but, you know, in terms of things that Rise likes to build, I think the more notable thing than the Mythic itself is Cosmic Drive, because of course Horse Rise loves Cosmic Drive. I mean, mm -hmm. that extra move speed for him to just go pew pew, vroom vroom, kite kite with the spells, fun times all around. Yeah. I yeah. mean, play Rise I kids. Mean, you, yeah, honestly, I've never seen anybody like ever build Cosmic Drive. It's like, I don't know, it, it just seems like an item that's not good. It could also be because uh, I'm stuck in what we, we, we cool people call Pisslow. Uh, bronze three, hard stuck. Let's go. 
Yeah, I feel like uh, bronze three players are not exactly equipped to do this thing called like using your in. movement speed as a ranged champion to get out of range of the other champions. Oh, exactly. You know, it that it, it really brings me back to uh, one time in one of my friend group, uh, somebody said that you can't kite with Jinx because you have to manage your rev stacks. Ah, uh, yes. Which, no, just. It it makes complete sense, you know. You can't kite with Jinx, so can't kite. You know, Jinx means you gotta learn something. It's you can't. impossible. Speaking, speaking of cosmic drive and <laughs> items that may be going underutilized, um, I think that is going to be a symptom for probably a little while longer. I mean, look at how Groomstone has blown up so quickly and so fast out of nowhere. Um, I did see a thread the other day about what's the end of it? It's like Serpent Fang or whatever, the item that does more damage mm. to shields and how mm. even once the shield is broken, the bonus damage continues through. Um, Which so is I think that wild. And apparently Kaisa Q, every tick actually procs the Serpent Fang weapon, like a passive. Wait, actually? So that's what the Reddit post said. I haven't seen it in action, probably because nobody builds it. But if that's if that's true, it's just another boon to Kaisa, who's already you know the number one marksman for the most part. So I mean, I think I think these underutilized items are still being explored and still being you know they'll eventually come to the forefront, whether it's after they get buffed into Oblivion or before that is yet to be seen. But I, I think that you know what the hell I think oh, items. I'm in the shower. You know, Cowboy, I think what you are being afflicted by is um, the lingering Zephyr curse. Uh, oh. Okay. Well, uh, we can yeah, still hear him, so. You can, you but I, I, I literally look like a, I look like a stretched out rock texture from like a 2010 game, so. It's a very oh, becoming look on you, Cowboy. <laughs> it is. I just. All right, so. Um. What were we talking now about? I already forgot. Cowboy is visible again. Well, we were talking about how you can always trust Reddit, but oh, of course, yes. Outside of Reddit mm -hmm. suggesting that some items uh, have the potential to seem way more broken than we realize they are once the meta shifts slightly for us to see the light on them, um, I would like to continue telling you about the trend of mid difference. In mid league, you see AoE God Squad 2O's Divine Ascension Ruby and Yone mid goes 12 and 0. Like, you know, it's just mid, mid league, mid diff, it works out, you know. And I do believe these games were occurring at exactly the same time, so there was some sort of weird magic going on in the universe that decreed that all games be mid diff at that time. I couldn't First, tell you. Sense what it is uh omega gaming unleashed who owes aoe team one legendary wolves managed to go one one with glaive esports rose which honestly is pretty impressive so it seems that cowboy you are perhaps not that misguided in scanning legendary wolves here perhaps but uh you know if if, if it was just the one time that it was mid diff it might have been because tf blade didn't play Jax. Hmm, I see. Yes, it's, uh, these things really do have an effect on the cosmos, don't they? Exactly. Um, there were a couple of one ones beyond that Legendary Wolves Glaive Esports Rose set. Uh, that was Anarchy Lime Darkseid, and then AoE God Squad Darkseid. So, that... And the Anarchy Lime 2-0 against AoE Team 1 actually did see a lot of back and forth in the gold graphs of both games, even though it didn't itself resolve in a 1-1 like these others. But this was just sort of a set of three sets right here. The Anarchy Lime Dark Side, AoE God Squad Dark Side, and Anarchy Lime AoE Team 1 that were just kind of our gold graphs are zigzagging all over the place games where teams were really trading those resources back and forth and having these highly contestable games, which I think are going to be interesting to see on stream if they keep up this dynamic into the future, because it definitely seems that the least predictable games are the ones that kind of evolve like Dark Side and Anarchy Lime here. Um, okay. 
And of course, Meme City Esports Rush to round out the list of our games that occurred in mid league uh, to Ode, their set that was off stream as well against Divine Ascension and Ruby, uh, including kind of a weird draft game that includes Seraphine and Talia solo laners. <laughs> Um, which is a little wild, but they did extraordinarily well. And at the point that I was looking at the analytics from this game, I realized that Meme City Esports Rush, like, seriously loves their Seraphine. I mean, Seraphine is a pretty well-contested pick. We are seeing a fair amount of Seraphine bans occur, and when she's left open, teams do like to try taking her. But... It seems to me that Meme City Esports Rush in particular do love their Seraphine. So while I couldn't necessarily tell you how to beat them, you could probably annoying you could probably annoy them sufficiently by pick or banning Seraphine from them. Yeah. Fair enough. Uh, I said it before and I'll keep saying it. Seraphine is cringe. If you play Seraphine, I have absolutely zero respect for you. I'm kidding, I love you. But she is also flexible between that mid lane and support, which is nice. She's really good in both roles. Her ultimate is just crazy, honestly. People say it's so Sona too. It's just a worse Sona ult because it's a projectile. I mean, it's it's a better Sona ult that requires slightly more planning than Sona ult. I mean, Seraphine literally yeah. is the Sona rework. The only reason it's not a Sona rework is because the hardcore Sona fan base would scream and cry. And also, that's probably less profitable for KDA, because Sona's already in a band. It's called Pentakill. Which is the better band. You know, just... Um, oh, it's happening again. So, now that I have tortured us with the shenanigans of mid-league, it's time to torture specifically Doctor with the shenanigans of heavy league. All right. So, Doctor... The sets that happened on stream for Heavy League this past week was uh, the Wyo Boomers versus Catalyst Blaze set and the Orbital mm -hmm. Chrome versus Bucky Stratosphere set. Which of these yeah. did you like more? Uh, definitely the Boomers Blaze set. Um, no shade to the Stratospheres, but it, it was it was not a good look. It was a complete and utter schlacking. Um, and yeah, the Boomers Catalyst Blaze was at least one one. We had some great stuff going on there, um, and both sets combined to me uh, kind of set up the storyline for Heavy League that I think we're at an edge of a bubble, um, and we're it's really getting ready to burst because when we look at the overall um, you know state of the league, when we look at the score lines and we look at the standings, they're really close. And when you look at the past teams and victories certain teams have beat other teams to then go on and get you know really smoked by other teams so i think coming into this you know week four as a week four yeah week four um and week five specifically we're gonna really start teams either really escalate and start skyrocketing towards the top of the table or plummeting and doing the exact opposite and i mean with certain teams being deadlocked top and bottom uh namely Glaive Amethyst and the Stratospheres, then you know we're in a position where it's that middle of the pack teams can really go one way or the other, starting with this week particularly. Um, and so with you know Boomers going one one again, they kind of stay still. Catalyst stays still after a rocky start as well. Um, and it's it's interesting. It it'll be really interesting to see how these teams actually shake up. After this week, I, I think this week is a really good one. We have some great games coming up on stream. We got VBO versus FGCU, uh, Hallback to last season, and we also have Akuma Glaives versus Lotus, which to me is really interesting because Akuma Glaives right up at the top of the um, standings as well. They're in second place. They have a couple losses, with them being um, eight and four currently. Um, and the only team better than them is Glaive Esports, whose only loss was the very first game they played, which was against VBO. And they've just won everything after that quite convincingly. Damn, okay. They, they got mad after that one loss. They were just like, nah, it ain't happening again. 
they took it personally. And I mean, when you yeah. look at their stats, it's absurd, right? They have the quickest average game time by almost three whole minutes. They have a 91.67% rate of getting first tower, 83% chance of getting the first inhibitor, 75% chance of first Baron and first dragon. It like those numbers are insane. Like that's just absurd. You shouldn't be getting these kind of numbers that consistently. We're only three weeks in, but come on now. That's that's a lot. That is quite a bit. Now average I... ADA of almost seven. Wow. Across average. the entire across team. Across the whole team. The entire team. Everybody. Almost a seven KDA. That's just wild. That is someone. Start killing these people more, please. <laughs> draft draft an early game <laughs> composition and just, even if you lose, just knock down the KDAs a bit, please. Um, but, you know, I do have a question because, Doctor, I know you're not super hyped about this Orbital Chrome Bucky Stratosphere set where <laughs> Orbital Chrome did, yes, kind of wipe. But I do have a question. And at risk of sounding a little mean here, <laughs> does this set say more about orbital chrome or bucky stratosphere because i'm not sure i i'm gonna be honest i don't think it really says much about either team i mean uh, unfortunately the stratospheres are pretty deadlocked at the bottom of the uh, leaderboard right now i mean they've lost everything so it's t gonna be tough for them to start clawing it back and with it being double round robin they obviously play all the teams a second time so that'll be their time for redemption to see if they can really pull it back um but i think when it really comes down to it there were i don't even want to say draft diffs but when you look at them look at the games there's some definitely big question marks and when we look at game two specifically which was the closer of the two when you talk to the other you know heavy analysts like juice box guy and dj they were like you know the game two draft was definitely much more comfortable for the team for um the stratospheres like they had lux mid hecarim jungle zyra support like they were just more comfortable it was closer that's what we need to see more of and I was not of that mind <laughs> on broadcast. I'm just like, why are you picking these dog champions? Like, pick something meta. When you look across the aisle, you saw Orbital Chrome. They picked Sejuani, which the best jungler pick ever if you want to actually win games. And, you know, that's where Draft Diffs comes in. But overall, I think the two teams are just, they played how we expected them to play overall. Right. Wait, hold on. Doctor, did you say Sejuani was good? Yeah. Number one jungler if you want to win games. I'm not, okay. I'm not saying I disagree. But you're wrong. I mean, it's Cowboy? I'm not. But you are wonderful. I would love to hear your counter argument because every time but I bring this up, nobody nobody disagrees and gives me counter arguments. They just go, yeah, Sidwan is pretty strong. So I, I, I would love to hear. No, Stop, Cowboy. Like, I, you, hmm? Do you think that your opinions on Sejuani might be a little biased based off of the fact that you are in bronze? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Sejuani's great in bronze. You just press R and you win the game. It's well, free. Yeah, okay. But like, she's not good right now. Okay, I, I so the agree. thing about Sejuani is <laughs> like, even when she's not a particularly highly contested jungle pick, she's still a really good jungle pick, well, particularly no. competitively, because when you can talk to and actually trust your teammates, you can then trust your melee auto attackers to help her proc her passive. Yeah, okay, fair enough. Can't argue with I, that. I just think R button go burr, honestly. Like yeah, you know, it's the same also... reason <laughs> like it's the same reason why people say, like, oh, play Annie in low elo, play Malphite in low elo. It's just you press R, and if your team has a keyboard attached to their computer, then you should win the team fight afterwards. Sure. Yeah, no, that's, that's fair. But like like you look at Sejuani and then you look at other junglers uh who are good, like pretty much in competitive like in competitive environments, they're good no matter what the meta is. Uh, Lee Sin, Elise, those kind of champions. Hmm. And then you look at Sejuani. Like, I don't, 
See, I don't, that doesn't click. That doesn't I click. I would to me. actually disagree. I feel like Elise definitely has to pass a certain threshold to really be worth picking in competitive. Um, She's I a do... top laner now, by the way. Oh yeah, Elise is one hundred percent a top laner now. Um, I hate it. Not a jungler, <laughs> just a top laner. But um, you know, w- with a champion like Elise, particularly as played in the jungle, Elise is a champion who kind of has to get ahead and then carry her team. Um, and that's the sort of thing that isn't necessarily a super reliable plan and competitive unless Elise is at a certain level within the meta. Well, I mean, yeah, she's, no, she's not there no, to carry herself. She's there to support yeah, the team. Exactly. Definitely, but like, I'm not saying she's good in solo queue because unless you're like a turbo smurf, 900 LP like a 900 million LP yeah. challenger, then yeah, but in, in competitive, she's crazy because you just throw Renekton top and then you get free tower dives every three minutes. Like, right. That's the idea. Right. Anyway. Yeah. I mean, the whole thing about Elise is she is a menace early and then she passes that off to her team and just stuns people yeah. periodically. I'm going to be fully honest. The reason I talk about Sejuani being so good in the leagues that we talk about here on Excellency is that, you know, they're not pro level leagues and that's not meant to be a slight to these teams it's no it's, it's completely it's, personal we just yeah, hate all the here actually <laughs> i'm just trying to be helpful because i see teams pick things like hecarim and i've been proved wrong on hecarim a couple times but he's much more difficult to operate or you know something like um, Kindred can be very difficult to operate which we saw this week as well we saw um, in the uh, was it the boomers matchup my sorry, I have old man brain. Um, yeah. yeah, it was in the Boomers matchup where, yes, the Kindred won the game, but it only went three and six. And you know, you can even go back onto our broadcast, and DJ had some very, very choice words about the pick itself. Um, and it's things like that that like you do need like team support, and you need to be on a certain level with your team to really make operate. Whereas like when I look at a lot of these compositions, I see Sejuani as just kind of a plug and play. You can pick her as long as your teammates, you know, are reasonably involved in the game. You can just press R, have some follow-up, keep just alive in the team fight. And your jungler at that point just becomes an alt bot, but for much longer than say an Elise would. Right. There is, there is something to be said for easy to execute champions that we don't really acknowledge enough. There is nothing better in particularly a competitive environment than reducing your margin for error. Easy to execute champions, reduce your margin for error. And on top of that, Sejuani is a great team fighting pick. And 5v5 front to back classic team fight is one of the easier team plans to carry out. This again, this could be my my bronze brain, you know, just like trying to turn the the dusty old cogs. But like, then why isn't Zach a contested pick? Because well, he brings like everything. Well, no, so there's, there's actually a good reason about this. Um, Zach just simply does less damage than Sejuani overall, um, but he he does all the same things. He does that have that long range engage. He has that long range team fight disruption. Um, you know, he's everything a tank should be. Um, and so some people do still pick Zach. We saw him um, earlier in the season actually in heavy league. Um, and when directly compared to Sejuani, it's just that Sejuani does more damage. Um, right at the end of the day, she's. Yeah. yeah. And actually enough. this most recent week I do believe we saw another Zach top in mid league as well. It didn't That's do well, twice but it, now, right? it was played. That's twice. Yeah, it's twice that we've seen the Zach top and I don't think it won last time either, did it? I I said something about it. I knew once upon a time whether it won that first time. Definitely didn't win this time. I don't have access to those chat logs anymore. So I I I, I couldn't even go back over the to rock texture. Oh, wow. Ah yes, that's, that's impressive. Yeah, I, um, I look like I look like the skybox when you like fall out of the void in the Oblivion dungeon. Oh, <laughs> Zephyr really very... did curse his comic relief role when he left. Yeah, he just left a curse with him. You know, maybe your Wi-Fi won't do what my Wi-Fi did, but you will at least be pixelated. Of course, I I always will be. I, after all, I'm just a figment of your imagination. So, ah, uh, fantastic! I'm, I'm, I'm 
I'm just I'm just like that one waifu character from your favorite game. You can oh, never get her. Fantastic. Isn't real. Oh man, that's that's a conversation for a different podcast. <laughs> it really <but>. is. <laughs> so anyhow, in the rest of the heavy week, we did see the VBO Akuma Glaive site go 1 1. FGCU Thunderbirds did 2 0 Orbital Chrome. So maybe the Orbital Chrome Bucky Stratosphere, Stratosphere game really did say maybe a bit more about Stratosphere than Orbital Chrome. Um, New Age and Lotus went 1 1. Glaive Amethyst, um, who. 4 0. Yeah. They, they really did do that again. Um, but to be fair, one of those sets was against Bucky Stratosphere. However, to their credit, one of those uh, sets was against Lotus, which is definitely seems to be struggling to keep some of their spotlight in this season because we have Glaive Amethyst giving them a run for their money. We have VBO still giving them plenty run for their money. And we have Akuma Glaives out here giving them some run for their money. So, Yeah, and I think, I think once this bubble bursts, when we start seeing teams really fall into place where they are in the standings, it's not going to be Glaive Amethyst falling behind. I mean, their strength of schedule so far has been quite heavy, um, whereas I think it's going to be that 2-3-4 slot that really comes and just shakes up because when you look at who we have there currently, it's Akuma Glaives, YO Boomers, and VBO. Um, and Akuma Glaives, they, before the season started, came in, they said they were going to be number one. They were going to be, un like, unstoppable number one, top of the charts, best team in the league. Um, and right now they're tied for second or tied for third however you want to call it they're eight and four um with 11 points so boomers and vbo they're really in the best position to overtake that because akuma glaive's main loss to, which was to glaive amethyst was a complete embarrassment for the team like they were ending in like 22 minutes 24 minutes it was just very unfortunate showing for them and so it's up to the rest of the teams to look at that and be like what did glaive do glaive amethyst do differently um and why was their set so convincing when you know kuma glaives are coming out still in one wanting and two owing certain other teams right um you know this is just sort of very interesting uh to see of the glaive name itself uh because you know what akuma glaives did kind of persuade me when they came out with all of that confidence saying that they were going to do so well. So when Glaive Amethyst has started to show them up to this degree, I'm taking notice. Um, you know, I think a couple more games were played in Heavy League. I don't know if we really care necessarily what happened in them. Uh, yeah, VBO, as we expect, they're doing really well right now. They... Uh, they two owed their other set. Um, Yo Boomers and New Age went one one. Um, you know, at this point, I don't know if we necessarily care about really what New Age Orbital Chrome Yo Boomers are doing because the comparison to this struggle for the top is just stealing the spotlight. Yeah. And I mean, those teams you mentioned are in like playoff contention, but we're still a long way from playoffs. And so there is still time for catalyst plays and Bucky stratosphere to get their stuff together and be relevant. Um, but for right now, it's that top of the chart, right? Like it's, who's going to actually take down glaive amethyst. It's who's going to become the second best team in the league right now. Um, because it's basically a toss-up. Any 1-1 one, one or any 2-0 oh between those you know, top three teams there suddenly changes everything right now. And so we're going to start getting better playoff contention looks in the next couple of weeks. We're going to see teams really start adapting to the meta. Um, Viego should be added in. God, I don't think it's this week. I think there was a conversation in one of the Discord channels about it, but um, it's either this week or next week. Viego will be enabled um, now. Will he be at release strength by that point? Who knows? We do still have a patch. Not not this week. We have a patch last week. Um, so, I mean, by the time we actually see him played, he could be nerfed into oblivion and we don't even get the chance to see him. But if, if he is 
untouched and he is playable, I do expect that to come out. And I think that the tippity top teams will make it a must ban pick bottom side of the teams. We might have some fun with that. I mean, hell we're seeing Yone, right? Like we'll probably see Viego. All right. Uh, so I'm going to say one thing and I'm immediately going to get kicked off this podcast. Okay. Uh, I think Viego is surprisingly balanced. You know, you're, I don't think you're that wrong. No, um, yeah, I, I do agree. I think that when he's fed, he feels harder to deal with than some other champions. That's, that's everybody. Yeah, that's People every say champion at this no, point. It's, not, it's, 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 it's all, all of them. Build- I'm sorry, I Doctor. Disagree. It's all of them now. The twelve and over Renekton is not as scary as the twelve and O Yone. I'm sorry, it's just not the same. Well, yeah, but they're both still fed, so obviously they're just gonna friggin' get a tractor and just. Right. Yeah, you know but, but like so the the 12 and 0 viego versus the 0 and 12 viego right like you see the you see the cloud burst if he's 12 and 0 you flash away if he's 0 and 12 you run at him because you know he's not going to do anything yeah, exactly. I mean, the thing about viego is simply the fact that he's really unpredictable at this point because he hasn't been out for long so even though i i wouldn't say he's insanely broken maybe he'll get tuned down i wouldn't complain if he did i'd probably complain if he got buffed i don't think i'd complain yeah. too much if they didn't touch him at all i mean after all we are way more worried about udir i think in our lives than we are about viegos anymore so who even cares about viego am i right that is, but that is a curse sentence what the- udir is stronger than the release champion but the fact does remain that, you know, the thing that makes Viego kind of a shocking, potentially oppressive pick is the fact that people don't know their their interactions with Viego the way mm-hmm. that other people do. And who knows? I don't know if Riot is necessarily even going to tell us. Um, I, I think they probably would as like bug fixes. Um, if they change any of the interactions, but as is, I actually do want to bring up this really weird interaction that I had with a Viego in solo queue where I was dead. I died like near the dragon pit. I was playing Zyra support because I'm a bad person and the Viego went to dive my ADC under turret. And as Zyra, as he had taken over me, when he used his Zyra abilities, and I'm not incredibly sure on this, and I wish I'd clipped it before the patch so that I could really review it and be sure, but the only explanation I have, because I hadn't touched him in ages, and I definitely wasn't the last person who hit him, the only explanation I have for the fact that I got credit for the kill on Viego was that one of his Zyra abilities must have spawned one of my passive plants under turret, Hmm. and that plant was the last thing that hit him. So that's an example of a really weird interaction that I would argue probably shouldn't exist that people just aren't going to know and aren't going to be expecting when they play against a Viego. And that's the sort of thing that makes someone look at the fact that they just died to a Viego and say, wow, that's broken. True. Yeah, well, like, most people aren't really going to care about that when there's bigger things like infinite Azir turrets. Oh my god, I just got a call on Discord. That's going to be fun in the audio. Yeah, I think, I don't know. Viego might be a non-starter. I do think he'll be played. Um, you know, we do see, obviously, weird champs across all the league. Zach tops. Um, maybe we'll start seeing these Ivern tops that's popping up in the LEC. Um, you know, there is still room for growth. And as these teams continue to practice and be more comfortable with each other, they're going to be allowed to really open up these champion puddles that we've seen from them so far and maybe bring them into, like, champion ponds or something like that. Um, and, you know, maybe by the end of the season, somebody will break out into an ocean. But we're only three weeks in, so these these players might might not be as comfortable as they they want to be. So, so what I'm hearing is we should tune into week four, which shall be the week of Viego or Vieno. Bye, everybody. Bye.